Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How many people are happy to be here today? You know what? Today is an awesome day. Let me tell you why. How many people had a bad week this week? Had something bad happen to you this week? How many people have went through something this week they'd rather not have? You see, today is the day that it's an opportunity that you're not going to have when we get to heaven. Because when we get to heaven, we're not going to have the opportunity to worship Jesus in the heat. We're not going to have the opportunity to worship Jesus through our, through our trouble, through our trial, through our sadness. That's an opportunity that we get here. Because once we get to heaven, we won't have that. The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. That's what it's talking about, that we have the opportunity to worship God in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our suffering, in the middle of the AC going out again at the beginning of summer. But, it is something that we get the privilege of doing. Right? Yes. Amen? Amen. Alright, so who has a, a nudge or a testimony they would like to share with us today? So, Mr. Tim has something. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm a caraholic. Hi, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, my good friend, Pastor Willie Gore, came to the house, came to the shop. They're going to work on his car. Through the week, through this week, somehow, three more trucks followed me home. It's amazing how that happens. Right? <laughs> so, Mr. Willie, and I talk about this passion or addiction, whatever it may be, for the buying junk. Yeah. And it really didn't dawn on me until that last song. We were riding back to war talking about how do we have this addiction? What? You know, we gave up smoking, we gave up drinking. <coughs> Is this what we're trading for? And he said, no, this is probably the only way the enemy can get to us. And when that thing said, the enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said, you're mine. Amen. It's about to you. Amen. 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 Anybody else before we get started? All right. So, the last couple of weeks I've beat up on the disciples pretty hard, haven't I? Kind of, yeah, yeah. So, today I'm going to be talking about them again. Um, and I don't really know what order to do this, so we're just going to do it. Hopefully it makes sense in your head as much as it does mine. Uh, let's go to... Uh, Do I have one in there from John? Yep. Let's go to that. So this is going to be John 21. Now, that I spoke about this last week. This is where Jesus is on the beach with, with the disciples. This is after he's been crucified. This is after he's been resurrected. And he's meeting his disciples. And he's sitting on the beach. And he calls them. And they come to the beach. And they're dragging the nets up. And again, they have this huge catch of 153 large fish. One day I'm going to figure out what that 153 means. But they caught 153 large fish, and he's sitting on the beach, and he's cooking, he's got a fire set up, and this is where we're at. This is where Jesus is speaking. Now this is the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, 
Do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter turned around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out amongst, amongst the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that this testimony is true, and that there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Today I want to talk about two different peoples. I want to talk about two different sets of disciples. We have the set that we've been looking at. The Peter that, that denied and betrayed Jesus. The Peter that forsake all of his teachings and drew a sword. The Peter that started to sink in the water. But we also have the Peter that Jesus spoke about. The rock that the church was built on. The one that stood up before 3,000 people that he just cowered down behind and said, you guys are the reason this happened. You killed him. Let me tell you about it. The same Peter who shadowed, healed people as he walked by. The same Peter who rejoiced while he was in prison. The same Peter that all of a sudden had boldness and confidence in Jesus. What is the difference? What happened between Jesus, Peter following Jesus and Jesus leaving this world and then Peter all of a sudden having boldness and confidence? Peter starting to do miracles left and right, right? Becoming the leader of the church. There's one thing that happened. Does anybody know what it is? Let's go to Acts. And this is Jesus being assembled with them. And being assembled together with them, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You have heard from Me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in His own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when He had spoken these things, while they watched, He was taken up and a cloud received Him out of their sight. Now a couple of things I want to point out before we, we jump to the time of power and boldness. When Jesus met Peter on the beach, and remember, I my opinion, this is Jesus letting Peter know that he knew. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Simon Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. And that's Jesus going, yes, I do know all things. But you needed to know that I know that you love me. But you see, he didn't sit there on the beach and say, Peter, are you sorry for betraying me? He didn't say, Peter, do you repent of cursing me? He didn't say, Peter, have you turned from those ways? He said, do 
you love me? Do you love me? That's what he asks. Do you love me? When we look at the life of all the disciples, not just Peter, and we look at it before the day of Pentecost, they were following Jesus under their own power, under their own ability. This is what they did because they tried, and that's why we see so many, so many failures throughout. That's why we see Peter being so zealous and saying, Lord, everybody else may, may turn from you, but I won't. And then a few scriptures later, he's cursing him and denying he even knows him. That's why Thomas stands up and says, if he's going to Jerusalem, all you guys get up. We're going to go die with him. And then you don't even see Thomas during the trial. You know? Because we can have emotion that goes way high, and we can have emotion that goes way low. But we notice after the day of Pentecost, they had boldness. They had power. And they had more of a steady, steadfast walk. Too often today, we have entire denominations who base it on do better. Do better. Just do better. Try to do this under your own strength. You can't. You can't do this and walk out a life pleasing up under your own strength. That was the whole point of Jesus coming. That was the whole point of Him leaving so that He could send the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost would come upon people. You see, the Holy Spirit would come upon David for a particular time, for a particular purpose. But then the Holy Spirit would leave. But after the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is here forever with us. It says the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the Spirit that dwells in us and will raise us from the dead. That's the Holy Spirit. Everything that Jesus did, He did under the power of the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost is, is such a monumental day because that is the day that when Jesus says, I will stick closer than a brother, understand a brother can follow you everywhere, but He eventually leaves you. The Holy Spirit will never leave you. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, you have the Holy Spirit that you can speak to. You have the Holy Spirit that you can rely on. That's why we see such a big change in the discipleship post Holy Spirit. Jesus even said, you will receive power to be my witnesses, to go into all the world. Why did we receive that power? If we look at the end of Matthew or Mark, whichever one comes up first, Matthew it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. When we look at Mark, Mark says pretty much the same thing. Here Jesus is, is speaking, and He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In My name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. We kind of need power to do that, right? We need the Holy Spirit for that. How many people feel like your life is on a roller coaster? Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. That's what the Holy Spirit is here for us. To make it more of a level playing field. I can tell you, before the Holy Spirit, you end up... I don't know if it was here or someplace else I was talking about how people would come to themselves. The, the prodigal son came to himself. He was in the middle of a pig's fight, in the middle of, of eating whatever, trying to survive, and it says that he came to himself. You see, without the Holy Spirit, it's easy to get lost. It's easy to get sidetracked. It's easy to walk away and not even realize that you've walked away. It's easy to go astray and not even realize that it's happened. 
You can still do it with the Holy Spirit. I'm proof of that. I've done it. But I can tell you, at least in my situation, it was never I came to myself. It was I chose. And I hate to say that, but sometimes the Holy Spirit points something out to me and I'm like, and I choose not to listen. But it's never that I come to myself anymore. Because before I get myself in that situation that the Holy Spirit's telling me, don't do this, it's a bad situation, and you're not going to like the results of this, and you're not going to like how it's going, you need to avoid this. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. It's not a come to myself moment. It's a realization of, yeah, you were right again. I was wrong. You know. I can tell you. I'm not going to say it's impossible to walk out of Christian life without the Holy Spirit, but it sure is difficult. Why would you do it? Why would you try to do something that is so much more difficult than it has to be? When Jesus left and went to the Father to give us what the Father had promised us, this was a promise from the Father to send the Holy Spirit to help us walk this life out. To have somebody to, to one, be right there to slap me on the back of the head and say, stop it. You know? Because Kim's not there all the time. You know? She does a good job when she's around to be like, stop. You know? That phone didn't do anything to you. I go pick it up. You know? But the Holy Spirit's always around. The Holy Spirit is always there. The Holy Spirit is... is when you leave outside of, of America and you get to some of these other countries, we separated here in America. But I have seen salvations over in Africa that go completely different. When somebody wants to get saved, they'll come up front and they're handed the mic. And with the mic, before anything, they confess their sins in front of everybody. I've done this, I've done that, I'm, 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 you know, and I repent of this. And they would repent of all their sins right there. And they were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit in one instance. When we look at the book of Acts, that's how we ended up going there too. Salvation and being filled with the Holy Spirit never meant to be two different things, but we are kind of separated. And let me tell you, you need the Holy Spirit. You absolutely need the Holy Spirit to walk this thing out. What is the one thing that Jesus has commanded us? To go. To go be a witness. How many people ever get scared when you go witness? I still do. I still do. But you know, here's the cool thing. With me anyway, and it's different with everybody. I'm not saying this is going to be you. But with me, whenever the I, I feel the nudge to go do something, whenever I feel the nudge to step out, I immediately get that, oh, I can't do that. You know what they're going to say? You know what they're going to do? You know what they're going to think? But there's a switch in there where I have to make the decision of, you know what? This is where I get laughed at today. And once I make that decision that I'm going to do it, it's almost like you can feel the Holy Spirit go, okay, let's go. And all of a sudden you have that boldness. All of a sudden you have that power. You have that confidence. And that's the Holy Spirit saying, I'm there with you. That's the Holy Spirit saying, you're not doing this by yourself. You're doing it with me, but you have to make the decision to do it. I'm not going to take over and do this for you. You have to make that decision. But as soon as you decide to do it, I'm there with you. And I'm going to walk with you through this. And I'm going to give you the words. And I'm going to give you the right thing to say. And I'm going to give you the boldness. And the Lord knows if we have to pray for somebody, I'm going to give you the power. That's how important the Holy Spirit is. Without the Holy Spirit, can you still do that? Yes, you can. But I can guarantee you as somebody who has done it without the Holy Spirit, you're nervous throughout the whole thing. Right? disciples before the day of Pentecost were following Jesus physically. 
they can touch him, they can talk to him, they can hear his voice. And a lot of times we feel like that's, you know, if I had that. If only I had that. How many people have ever thought that? Man, this would be so much easier if I had Jesus sitting next to me. Man, this would be so much easier if I could just walk up and tap Jesus on the shoulder. But let's look at the lives of the disciples. The lives of the disciples exploded when Jesus left and the Holy Spirit came. That's when you start seeing the disciples do the crazy things. Right? Yeah. That's when you start seeing the disciples that you're like, He's been with God. That's when you start seeing the disciples that they say he's just like that Christ will call them Christians. Did they mess up? Yes. Read Acts. You'll see Peter and Paul got into a knockdown drag out. You'll see people getting mad at each other and going, I'm not, even, I'm not even going on the mission field with you. You're not going with me. I don't want you to go with me. I don't like you no more. You still see things like that. But you see a boldness in their walk. And even though we're human, and we choose sometimes to ignore what the Holy Spirit is telling us, the Holy Spirit is always there telling us. And we can see examples of that in the disciples' life where hindsight you could look and go, yep, Peter ignored the Holy Spirit there and had to get pulled back in line. Or Paul, you know, maybe missed the Holy Spirit there, but you see him getting pulled back in line. Anybody give me an example of that? Personal? Personal or biblical? Cool. See, Paul got mad at a certain person and said, no, I don't want him part of my ministry. I don't want him to have anything to do with me. I'm not going with him. And then we see when Paul was in jail, he's like, hey, send that guy here to me. He's, he's useful. He's good. I want to talk to him. You know. So, I know it's hot today, and I'm, I'm not going to go long, but what I'd like for all of us to do today, I have one last thing I want to say before we, we pray. And this is for somebody here, I don't know who, but the Holy Spirit has really laid this on me, in that there was a, 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 somebody I know, really close, who was seeking baptism of the Holy Spirit. He came out of the Southern Baptist Movement, sat on the boards of the Southern Baptist Movement, pastored churches in the Southern Baptist Movement, and all of a sudden uh, begins to see the Holy Spirit, begins to see the effects of the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I want this. I want this. And he begins to pray for the Holy Spirit. And he's, he's not getting what he feels he wants. He's not getting a prayer language. He's not, he's not speaking in tongues and he's seeking after it. He's like, I want this, I want this, I want this. And the Holy Spirit points something out to him. And there was a church a few years earlier that, that he had voted to kick out and really hurt this church because they believed in the Holy Spirit. And at the time, the Southern Baptist was like, no, you can't be here. And he was one of the ones that voted them out. And the Holy Spirit pointed that out to him. And he goes to this, this pastor of this church and he apologizes to them. Alright? That's not what the Holy Spirit was pointing out. See, the pastor of the church never had a problem with him. Even though the Bible says if you're coming to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you that you're not even supposed to bring your, your gift, you leave it there, you go find your brother and you make that relationship right. That's how important relationships are. And he stopped and he looked this up and traveled to this person and apologized to him. But the thing that the Holy Spirit needed him to do was not necessarily apologize to him. The Bible says we have to forgive, right? It says that if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven, right? Right. You understand that applies to you too. You have to forgive yourself. You have to forgive yourself. You have to let go of the past. You have to say, you know what? It's not there no more. It's been bought. And this guy had to forgive himself for some of the things that he had done in the past. And as soon as he had forgiven himself and let go of that, lo and behold, 
Our past is our past. And Jesus didn't come to clean up our past. He didn't come to move into a closet. He done away with it. We don't have a past. Story. We've been born again, right? So, which life are you talking about? Are you talking about the life before I was born again? Because that one doesn't exist no more. I've been born again. And that's the only thing that comes toward us going forward. So don't let the enemy bring up your past. And don't you bring up your past. You have to learn to forgive yourself. You have to learn to move on past that. Today, we're going to take just a few short minutes, and I want everybody to find a place that you can get alone to where you can be silent and hear the Holy Spirit. All right? And there's a couple of things that I want you to do. Number one, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life that is unpleasing to you that I need to do away with? And if there is, determine in your heart right now that no matter what the Holy Spirit says, you're going to do away with it. For some of you, it would be easy. The Holy Spirit will tell you, hey, you need to get rid of this. And you're like, all right, it's done. But some of you, especially those that have been walking with Jesus for a while, it's not so easy to get rid of something that you've held on to for that long. And when the Holy Spirit comes to you and says, hey, you need to get rid of this, your first response is, uh -huh. Why? Why? That ain't hurting me. That's not hindering my wall that we know of. The Bible says to determine in your heart that you won't sin against God. Before you pray, determine in your heart that no matter what the Holy Spirit says, that you're going to do it. Whatever He says, that it is worth more to you to be pleasing to God than it is to hang on to any earthly thing that we have. So we're going to take about 10 minutes, and this is what I want. Everybody pray, ask the Holy Spirit, is there something in my life that I need to get rid of? And determine that whatever it says, that we're going to do that. We're going to make the decision, okay, I'm going to get rid of that. And number two, if you don't feel that you have the Holy Spirit, ask for Him to come into your life. Ask for Him to come in. We say all the time. We, we get things kind of mixed up when we say that Jesus lives in our heart. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for me. He's there defending me against Satan. He is there at the right hand of the Father right now. You know who lives in me? The Holy Spirit. The Father sent us the Holy Spirit to help, help guide us. If you feel for a second that maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you feel for a second that maybe you just want a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. All you got to do is ask. It says that He's faithful. Well, all you have to do is ask. So, I'm going to get Thad to put on a little bit of music. We're going to, like I said, about, about 10 minutes. It's not going to take long. But just find you a place that you can get alone and silent. Ask the Holy Spirit, is there something in me I need to get rid of? And then ask the Holy Spirit, you know what? I don't want just a little bit of you, I want all of you.